Greetings, this is Dyslexi. Today, we're going to talk about flying in DCS Huey. This is oriented towards those who have basic flight familiarity from games like Arma or similar. The goal here is to make a DCS level fidelity helo sim more accessible to anyone who's looking to deepen their helo flight experience. Now, first, the most important disclaimer. I'm not a pilot. This is not real flight instruction. If you take this information and use it in a real helicopter, you're making a bad life decision, it'll probably hurt you. This is intended purely to help people transition from games to high fidelity helo flight sims. Nothing more, nothing less. If something goes wrong in a sim, you simply respawn. If you want real helo instruction for use in real flying, take that route. This is not a replacement for that. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk a bit about the Huey. The Huey is a multi-role aircraft. The DCS iteration allows you to carry troops or cargo, do sling loads, or act as a full-fledged Huey gunship. Weapon usage is fairly simple, avionics are simple, and it sports a traditional single rotor and tail rotor design that makes for rather interesting flight dynamics. It's the iconic Vietnam era Huey, and the only thing we're really missing with it is a Vietnam terrain, but maybe in the future. And while they're at it, I wouldn't mind seeing a load show up, but I digress. The Huey's great fun because unlike pretty much anything else in DCS, there's very little you have to remember about it when you play. You can step away from it, come back, and be able to have a good experience without time-consuming refresher training on avionics, weapon employment, and all the other stuff that acts as a barrier to entry for the DCS A-10, Black Shark, and similar. Now, I'll be making the basic assumption here that you have some fundamental understanding of how helos are employed. Not necessarily the sim-level flight dynamics, but rather the concepts that you might find yourself using in something like Arma's flight model. So, of course, it's highly recommended that you read up on how helicopter flight works at a, at a simulation level. So, for instance, the DCS Huey manual has a great deal on this, and there are many sites and books you can read or pick up that cover these things in depth. As you practice and learn the aircraft, you'll want to reread this kind of material from time to time, as the more experience you gain, the more meaningful it'll be. Some things won't click until you've flown around a bit. So next up is a control setup. I personally consider a joystick, throttle, track IR, and rudder pedals to be the bare minimum for flying the DCS Huey. Uh, having an actual rudder pedal set instead of a twist joystick is very helpful. You can eke by without a pair, but I'd certainly recommend you pick them up if you seriously intend to develop your flight skills. Of course, track IR is essential. My personal setup at the moment consists of the throttle from the Warthog Hotas, uh, CH product pedals, and a Microsoft Sidewinder 2 force feedback joystick. And yes, that's the old one. Yes, that's the one that's no longer in production. You can pick up a Sidewinder force feedback 2 on uh, eBay, refurbished. And if you're, if you're really seriously interested in this sort of thing, I'd highly recommend it. Now let's talk about the helo controls more specifically for a bit so I can explain why I use what I use. So this little graphic up here in the upper left, that shows my controls. I'm going to leave it on the whole time so you can follow along at home. So to start off with our helicopter controls, this right here is a cyclic. The cyclic controls the way you pitch the aircraft. And the upper left, that big cross. I'll move it around a little so you can see. That's the cyclic. Behind that, you see it's where it says Bell Huey on those two pedals. Those are the anti-torque pedals. Or rudder pedals. They're represented on the bottom of the uh, that upper left graph. I'll push the left one in here. And there's the right one there. These control the yawing of the aircraft. Right there, that bar, pull it up, push it down. That's a collective. You pull it up, it causes the helo to ascend. You push it down, and it causes it to ascend. On the left side, you can see it's in the upper left. There's a little twisty thing on the collective, and this is the throttle. For most purposes, or most usage that we'll have here that I'll be talking about, you don't actually need to use that, but it is represented on that control graphic on the lower left of it. So you're probably wondering why I use a force feedback stick when I have the rather expensive Warthog stick sitting there unused. Uh, in short, a force feedback stick is a much closer representation of how a force trim cyclic system works in an actual helicopter. Now I'll demonstrate this with the virtual stick. And remember that all of these control inputs mirror what I'm actually doing with my physical controls. So with a traditional spring centering joystick, I start in the center position like this, and then I move my, the stick against the spring resistance like so. If I let go, it recenters. So if I move it up like this, 
I'm holding there against the spring. If I center it, every time I move left, or I move right, or forward, or back, there's a bump in the center because of the springs. I have to overcome that each time. This ends up being not terribly precise for helicopter work. Helicopters operate with very small cyclic inputs, like really, really small, much smaller than most people expect. You often need to make very fine corrections in several different directions in rapid succession, like this. So if each time you do that, you're bumping over the center spring, you know, the spring centering force, it's clumsy. It's not as precise. In a helicopter, you need to be pretty precise. So you, you can use a spring stick. Don't let that stop you if you're interested and that's all you have. Uh, if you do use a, a, a joystick, like a spring centering joystick, find one that has an adjustable spring to it, or do a mod for it. For example, the... Uh, the Warthog stick. There's a spring mod you can do that'll loosen it up quite a bit. But, for example, the default Warthog spring is way too stiff for this. It's, you're not going to get good controls out of that. Uh, just generally speaking, a force feedback stick like mine allows for really smooth, easy control inputs without having to fight the spring. So one other aspect of this, and let me take off real quick so we can kind of show it in, uh, in action. When you're flying a helicopter, you often find yourself having to hold a stick in a specific position to maintain your flight profile. You might need to do this for quite a while. So for example, right now, I'm flying forward and as you can see I have the cyclic pushed much of the way forward. The force trim system is giving me resistance, so I can feel that I'm pushing out of the trimmed area. So this can be a little fatiguing, especially with a spring stick, it's, it's really obnoxious. Now, the difference between a force stick and a spring stick if I have a helicopter like this or the Black Shark that has a force trim system, I can press and hold the, uh, the trim button, press and release it, and it'll basically cause the position I'm holding the stick to become the new center. So right now, I'll press the trim button. Now if I let go of the stick, it stays right there. So now if I pull back on the stick and then let it go, it returns to that, that new center position. Basically this means that now at this point, that upper left or that upper center portion of the of the graph you see, that's the new center position. It's very easy to hold the stick there. So I'm gonna keep flying like this for a while. It helps allow me to do more precise controls. It helps lessen fatigue. And that's just how they really work. So now let's say I change my flight profile again. So now I'm gonna pull back a bit, slow down, we're going pretty fast there. Let's say we slow down to now we'll go down to 80 knots. So now I'm at the, as you can see in the graph, I'm at the center of the, of the joystick's range of movement, but because I'm trimmed to the top of the range of movement, I'm actually feeling resistance on the stick. So now if I hold it here, this nice little flight profile we've got going, roughly 80 knots, now I'm trimmed back there. So now I'm trimmed in the center again. Easy, nice, relaxed. Uh, there's also another button I can use. If I want to just turn it to the neutral position, I can press my trim reset button. You can't really see it happen. But now the trim's returned to, to center. And this is how a, a real helicopter's controls work, and that's assuming, of course, that the Hilo has a force trim system. DCS is modeled to the level of insane detail that down here you can actually see, see down here there's a force trim button. I can flip that switch on and off if I want to take away the force aspect of it. Uh, I've yet to see any actual reason to do that. So if you can afford it, and you're passionate enough about something like DCS Huey to make the investment worthwhile, I'd highly recommend picking up a Sidewinder 2 force feedback that's been refurbed. I haven't flown real helicopters, so I couldn't tell you exactly, but I've flown a number of different multi-million dollar uh, helo sims at trade shows I've been to, and that's what kind of made this an interest of mine in the first place, was the, and why I bought a force stick, because the force trim system made sense after using the real controls. So now, as far as pedals go, uh, especially when you're flying at lower speeds, Pedal input is done all the time. If you're landing, you're doing all kinds of pedal work. You're having to very frequently go through the center of the range of motion, out to the other side as you're changing collective settings and stuff like that. The CH pedals, the CH Pro pedals I have, they're not bad. The problem is, is that they, like you know, like a traditional joystick, are spring centered. So you have a bump in the center of the range of motion. So you hit that bump and you have to move past it. It's a little obnoxious. It's not how a real one works. It's not perfect. There's mods you can do that'll change that. Uh, you can get rubber bands and stuff and take the spring out and take the, the bump out and all that. If you want to splurge and you, you got the money for it and you're really passionate about it, 
There's a set of pedals that I have on order right now called uh, MFG Crosswinds that help to basically have a, a better system involved. It's a camming system instead of a spring centering system. So there's less of a bump. So I'm really looking forward to, to getting those. When I get those, I'll probably put some, some kind of video up and talk about them briefly. Uh, but So yeah, so that's pedals. Pedals are really important. There's not much else to say on this point. Now, for the collective, like I said earlier, I use the Warthog's uh, Hotas Throttle. I use the, the Warthog Stick for jet sims, but I don't fly jets that often. I like helicopters a lot more. Uh, I set up the, the throttle to where if I pull it towards me, it increases the collective like this. I push it away, it decreases it. And the reason I do this is because that's the the muscle memory you have in reality. That's how they work, physically work. I pull up on it, and I push down, right? So I don't want to have inverted muscle memory in case I'm ever in an actual helicopter. So as to track IR, well, I mean that's it's pretty self-explanatory. If you intend to fly in DCS and you don't have a track IR. You should correct that. So that, that covers my controls and what they do. Next, let's talk about the, the key cockpit instruments. There's a ton of stuff in here. I couldn't tell you what all of it does, but I do know what's proven the most helpful for, for my own flight purposes. Uh, obviously, down here we have the airspeed indicator. Kind of a big deal. The important thing to remember about this is that if you're flying at slower than roughly 20 knots, the airspeed won't display correctly, and that's because the rotor wash is actually confusing the sensor and it can't tell how fast you're going. Uh, the little red mark is right above 120 knots. That's the do not go faster than this or bad things will happen mark. So try to avoid flying faster than that. If you do end up flying faster than that, slow down as soon as you reasonably can, but do so gently and smoothly. Uh, next we have the vertical velocity indicator, this thing right here. This tells us how quickly we're ascending or descending in thousands of feet per minute. This is incredibly important in a helicopter sim. Uh, more on that later, just remember that you're going to need to be looking at this gauge a lot. Last but not least, is this right here. This was a missing piece of the puzzle for me at one point. Uh, before I watched this, I never quite understood why I'd fail in some flight regimes. I knew there was some kind of pattern happening, but I couldn't quite figure it out. The inner part of this gauge displays your rotor RPM, and it's times 10, so this is 300 uh, revolutions per minute, 200, 100, and so on. The green and red sections indicate the safe and unsafe ranges for operation. And there's the obvious assumption that if you're below this, if you're in this range, that's unsafe as well. Uh, I tend to watch the, in the interior one, the, the rotor RPM, more than I watch the outer one. If you dip below the safe rotor RPM, you'll see the... Uh, a warning light illuminate. If you dip below safe rotor RPM and a certain threshold of the engine at the same time, you'll see the light illuminate as well as hear a siren sound. If you go above this into the red, you won't get any kind of audible alarm, but you will see that light illuminate. I'll explain the significance of all this as we talk about different maneuvers and such. So, once again, these are the important ones. The speed indicator, vertical speed indicator, dual tachometer. Torque one's probably pretty important as well. I just haven't had a need to, to really look at it. Oh, and then of course we have the altimeter. The radar altimeter is here. And we have the uh, the drum altimeter here. We've kind of we've gone through how the key instruments and how the flight controls work. And now, just to kind of illustrate how much there is to flying a helicopter, we're going to do a takeoff, in which I don't do anything aside from keep the controls centered. So I'll take this the cyclic center that, we got the pedal centered and this is going to really help to show just how much work is involved in keeping things sane in a helicopter so you can see everything's centered now I'm just going to smoothly increase collective Let's just watch what happens as I do this collective's coming up right about there so we start yawing right we start flying forward so now I'm going to take control before we hit these wonderful Air Force gentlemen over here. And I will set us back down. The question there is, why does that happen? Why do I yaw? And why do I start flying forward like that? I'm doing that curving right hand path. Well, in short, as I pull collective, I'm changing the angles of the blade, the pitch of the blades. This causes them to bite more of the air. 
and they produce more lift that way. When they're producing more lift like that, they're biting more air, they're producing more torque. Since they spin that way, they spin to the left, the opposite reaction to that is for a body of the aircraft, of the helo, to spin to the right. So this, this manifests as that right yawing tendency. This is why the tail rotor's there. So when we're going to take off, we're pulling up on the collective, we apply some left pedal to counteract that. Now this is really important in helicopter flight. You have to remember this. To every single time you change collective, every little bit you do, every time you pull on that bar, this will change how much pedal input you need to get. Keep your nose pointing to where you want it to be. This becomes less of a factor when you're flying fast because the, the aircraft, the tail rotor, doesn't have as much influence at that speed. But everything low power or low speed, every change of the collective changes how much torque is being produced. Thus, every movement needs to be balanced with an appropriate pedal change. Now, for a Huey, the correct takeoff settings look like this. We take the stick, we bring a little bit back and to the left, right around there, and then you put in a little bit of left rudder. So to take off, you're gonna, I'm going to smoothly pull the collective up until I see the helo start to get light on the skids. This is where you're generating enough thrust to pick up all the weight of the aircraft, but you're not yet going to a full-fledged hover. Gently pull the collective up. Let's see a certain, there we go. All right. So now, now I'm in an actual hover. So I have to keep adjusting my pedals, keep my nose pointed where I want, and then I adjust the cyclic get myself hovering in roughly the same area. When hovering, you want to look a little bit ahead of you. You don't want to look down right at the ground or right in front of you. You want to look a little bit further ahead, and that helps to keep you in a more stable hover. Now, remember there's a slight delay in the responses of the Huey to any cyclic or collective changes. It's not instantaneous. You need to keep this in mind and strive to be a few seconds ahead of the helo. You have to be thinking ahead so you don't end up constantly fighting yourself which turns into what's known as pilot-induced oscillations. These are bad. You see it really severe, you wreck the helo. You also need to come comfortable with the notion that the helo will kind of rock and bob a bit, naturally, as a result of the physics of helo flight. You don't need to try to erase every little bit of that. You'll be fighting a losing battle. When you're hovering, as long as you're within about half of your rotor diameter's distance to the ground, you'll be in what's known as ground effect. And now we're in a hover and we're not gaining any altitude. If you're hovering in ground effect, it's easier, it requires less power. If you're hovering out of ground effect, it requires more power. Uh, you, can, you can basically think of ground effect as being like hovering on a cushion of air. It's more complex than that, but that's a good way to, to kind of summarize it, to visualize it. If I climb up any higher, I'll no longer be in ground effect, it'll require more engine power to stay in this kind of hover. So, for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to do something a little different here. Because so I want to demonstrate several techniques or several um, flight concepts that kind of can be shown in this regime. So, I'm going to do a, a slightly modified takeoff. This isn't how you would normally take off. But I want you to see what happens when I do it. So, from my hover, I've got my cyclic, my uh, collective is set like that. I'm not going to touch it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to nose myself gently down and fly forward. You see the helo, the helo shakes a little bit, a little bit of vibration happening there. The speed starts to climb. Center the pedals a little bit more. Now you see we get to over 40 knots. And suddenly, even though a second ago we couldn't get enough power to get out of that hover, get any higher, now suddenly we're flying with some mysterious new lift. So that first thing, that little that shutter that happened is a thing called transverse flow. For our purposes, it's not really important to go into why that happens. You just need to know that that's something separate. That happens at a low speed. Uh, it's the dynamics of how air is going through the rotor system. You can read up on it. It's interesting. Um, just remember that it's its own little thing. Don't confuse that with this next part. This next part is that extra special lift that we just got there. So like I said, I didn't move the collective at all. We just suddenly started gaining altitude. We started gaining lift. This increased lift is known as translational lift. And for every knot of airspeed that you add, you gain a bit more lift. Until you hit a phase, it's known as effective translational lift, or ETL. 
where you're now able to fly with a power setting that otherwise wouldn't even get you more than half of your rotor diameter off the ground. So that, that whole thing was done without me changing the collective at all. I'm still the same collective setting that I was earlier, which couldn't get me off the ground. I mean, it kept me in a hover, but it only was a ground effect hover. So you gain translational lift as you speed up, and you lose it as you slow down. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to leave the collective alone again, and I'm going to simply slow down. So I'll pitch my nose up a bit, maybe throw in some pedal. You'll see that I'm climbing. My vertical speed is over a thousand feet per minute up. My uh, horizontal speed is at 60 knots and dropping. Put in a little left pedal to try to get some drag going on. Now we're slowing, slowing, slowing. Getting there. 20 knots. That little shake was transverse flow. Right there. You see our speed's dropping. Our vertical speed's dropping. And any second now. There we go. Now we're descending. So I'm use my pedal to maintain my uh, my heading. So we're probably going maybe 10 knots or so. Like I said, uh, below 20 knots, your airspeed indicator is unreliable. So it looks like we're, we're probably making 5, 10 knots, something like that. And we're descending at 500 feet per minute. So I don't expect you to sit through this whole thing. We'll just skip ahead. But the important part is we're descending 500 feet per minute because we don't have enough lift to keep ourselves in the air in this kind of near hover. The important question is, what happens when we get down there? Are we going to land or are we going to hover? 60 feet, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 6, 5. So no, it doesn't land. Now that I'm back in ground effect, the collective setting that I've had is enough to keep me in a ground effect hover. Pretty cool. So that's translational lift and ground effect. And transverse flow, but that's not as important. So I'm going to set down, and then we're going to do uh, a more proper takeoff. Kind of show how that's supposed to happen. We'll pick ourselves up into a hover first. So we got the settings for that. Bring the power up, the collective up. There we go. So I'm going to push the nose forward, and this time I'm going to push the nose forward. I'm going to add a little bit of collective so I don't sink at all. And we'll maintain roughly that heading and that collective setting. Fly forward, and we very quickly find ourselves being picked up, both from the increased collective as well as the translational lift. So as you're going faster and faster, you'll see the need for tail rotor and pedal usage taper off, and the helo will start to fly more like a plane. When you get to this point, like right now, you can see that my pedals are centered. This is the easy part. You simply bank the cyclic, banks the aircraft, do nice sweeping, looping turns like this. If you want to go up, you can pull collective to make you rise. If you want to pitch up, you pull back on the cyclic. If you want to pitch down, you point, push the cyclic forward. And every time you do any movement on any of these controls, you do it in a nice, smooth manner. You have these blades whirling above your head. You don't want to agitate them unnecessarily. So that's the very basic introduction to the, the really crucial controls. You can see them there, what they're doing. The, the instruments, the control settings, and all that stuff. Ground effect, translational lift, uh, basic idea of how to get into a hover. What we're going to get into next will be a bunch of different scenarios that help to illustrate some of the things you might have picked up from Arma or other non-simulators that can get you killed. And we'll also cover how landing works. The two coincide quite a bit, as it turns out. At this point, we've taken off and we understand the, the basic factors that are at play there. There are more. You should definitely read up more on the different aspects, but this is the fundamental stuff that you need to know. I don't want to spend too much time talking about level fast flight. It's pretty straightforward, you just need to practice it. You slow down by pitching up slightly and reducing collective, like so. You can slow down a bit faster by being a bit more aggressive with this, to a point. Whenever you're doing these kinds of speed bleeds, you need to pay very close attention to your rotor RPM. 
You can't let it decay or you run into some pretty bad things. If you're not careful, you can easily bleed off your rotor RPM, and that'll cause some major issues depending on your altitude. Likewise, you can't just drop your collector straight down and expect to fall like a rock. This will cause a rotor overspeed, and it's similarly bad news. You can see my alarm going off there. The part of flight that took me the longest to master, which is kind of to be expected, is the whole getting back on the ground side of things. Now, this is primarily because some of the techniques that you use in a game like Arma to land rapidly don't really translate into reality. If you want to do a really slow, nice, and gentle LZ descent, that's one thing. But you often need to do a combat landing, and you have to make things go a bit faster, which is where problems tend to develop. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is a, uh, a steep landing, the kind you'd likely see in Arma. This is going to result in a crash. So here we are set up, we're doing a steep approach. This is very Arma style. I'm going to lower collective, I'm going to flare, and I'm just going to come down pretty aggressively and try to hit the, uh, probably just in front of that building. So I'm dropping collective, flaring back, leading speed. Suddenly I have RPM limit. I'll do another example of this so we can, we can see another uh, version of that issue. This time we'll fly, we'll try to land over that control tower. So once again we're going to turn in, we'll go for that control tower, and we'll do what's a, a fairly steep and uh, aggressive landing or attempted landing. So we're centered up on the control tower, we'll go flying a little bit closer to it. I'm going to drop collective pretty dramatically. And the idea is that I'll just pull collective when I get closer to the ground, right? That should be enough to, to arrest my descent. You'll notice as I'm, as I'm going here, you see the rotor RPM start to come on. I'm not going to address that for the moment for demonstrations purposes. I'm just going to flare myself to where I can come down more or less vertically on these things. And now you notice you heard something different, and we're going in. What's happening there is the single biggest element of landing in a simulation helicopter. It's called vortex ring state, or settling with power, also known as VRS. Now, let's watch that final bit again, and this time, let's pay attention to two things. The airspeed indicator, and the vertical velocity indicator. You'll see that as the forward speed slows, the already steep vertical velocity suddenly plummets. Now, several things are happening very quickly here. As we talked about earlier, translational lift is best above roughly 20 knots of airspeed. And this is where you're essentially outrunning your rotor downwash and the rotor system is working with clean air. Once you slow below roughly 20 knots and attempt to come into a hover, translational lift will subside and the helicopter drops somewhat if no collective power is applied to counter that loss of lift. Now, what happens next is from the high sink rate. Settling with power occurs when the air that the rotors are pushing down is being sucked back up through the rotor system due to how quickly the helo is descending. It's pretty much outrunning its rotor wash. The air is rushing up faster than the rotors can push it down, so the net flow is up instead of down. If the air is not being pushed down, there's a massive loss of lift, and you fall out of the sky. VRS happens from a combination of factors. It's a descent rate of at least 300 feet per minute, low forward airspeed, and the rotor is using from 20 to 80 percent of the engine power. Now, auto rotations don't have to worry about VRS because of that engine power aspect, but normal powered flight has to concern itself with the sink rate and the airspeed primarily. We'll show one more example of VRS. So this time I'm going to land, I'm going to attempt to land at the, uh, there's a little cottage at the end of the runway. We'll fly for that. Uh, I'll be coming in at a descent rate that's in excess of the VRS danger area. As long as I stay above 20 knots, the translational lift will be in effect and I'll be okay. So essentially the rotor wash will be getting swept away by the, uh, the oncoming air and VRS won't be able to establish. But you'll notice that as soon as I, as I slow and I dip below that speed, the already low sink rate that I have is going to cause VRS to occur. I'll sink further down because of translational lift going away and it'll all come together and horrible things will happen. So I'm doing a slightly curving approach to try and get this time just right. My collector's down. I'm washing on my instruments to make sure I don't do a rotor overspeed. And I'm just going to flare back. Flare, you can see me going through 60 knots. 40. 30. 20. Here's where VRS is happening, right there. So that was a uncomfortable but survivable landing.
So VRS is the most common mistake people seem to make when flying a Helosim. It's critically important that you be aware of each element of VRS. The engine power thing is a constant state that you don't really have to factor in, aside from doing auto-rotations or, or tail rotor recoveries, uh, or it doesn't really matter that much. But your descent rate and forward speed are easy to keep track of, and you always need to be looking at that. Don't rely on eyeballing your descent rate. Don't try and look out and say, oh, well, this is 500 and this is 1,000 feet per minute. The higher you are, the angle of terrain, all sorts of things will factor in to make it difficult for you to judge that. Your instrument, your vertical speed indicator is there for a reason. Make use of it. It's conveniently lined right up with your cyclic, so you can glance down at it or keep it in your, your field of view at all times. That'll save your life. Your virtual life. Uh, what I like to do is I have a safety margin for speed. Where I'll never, I'm always watching my, my uh, airspeed indicator, I'll never dip below that speed unless I've made doubly sure that my vertical speed is under control. Personally, I've chosen 40 knots as that, that number. As long as I'm above 40 knots, I can descend as fast as I'd like, as long as I don't overspeed my rotor. So right here, I can drop a lot of collective. I'm going a thousand, thousand feet per minute down, roughly. Not overspeeding yet. So it's not a big deal. As long as I stay above that 40 knots, I'll be fine. Here, I'll just ease my way out of that. Get back in the air. So next we're going to demonstrate a simple uh, VRS happening at a higher altitude and a, a, a basic recovery from it. So as with any situation in a helicopter, the more altitude you have, the more time you have to make something of it. It allows you to, to realize there's a problem, uh, address the problem, take the corrective actions, and find a place to land. So for the purposes of illustration here, we're going to start at over a thousand feet of altitude. So we have a good amount of time to, to show what's happening. So what's going to happen is if we get up to about a thousand feet or, or thereabouts, I'm going to come to a hover, and then I will simply drop my collective until we're sinking fast enough for VRS to take over. What you're going to see is the sink rate is going to slowly drop from my collective settings, and then VRS is going to hit, and the needle will plummet. If I apply more collective after VRS has already had a chance to form, at best it won't help much, and at worst it just aggravates the situation. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna set up VRS here, I'm gonna do a recovery from it, and then we'll talk about what happened, we'll do it again. So I'm coming to a, a rough hover. And now I'll start dropping my collective. That's a few for a minute. Uh, flare a little bit. That's trans transverse flow. I'm not changing my collective at this point. Just trying to get myself. Alright, so there we go. We see it dip through 2,000. We're on almost 3,000 feet per minute sink. And this is a vortex ring. So now if I pull in power, you see that nothing's really changed. I'm torquing myself around, but I'm not changing my sink rate. So how do I get out of it? Tell myself in some direction to break myself falling through that column of, of vortexing air. How do I get out of that? How do you get out of VRS? The common answer is that you push the cyclic forward to get out of the vortex. And while this is correct, because you do need to get out of the vortex, it's missing the fact that you can do it in any direction. It doesn't have to be forward. Uh, forward, back, left, right, it doesn't matter. All that needs to happen is you need to break free of that column of disrupted air. So we'll do that again, we'll set up the same kind of uh, VRS state. Uh, and then I'll call what I'm doing. And you'll be able to see that just by moving in any direction, I'll just pick a random direction as I'm going down. It's any direction will get us out of that, things will be kosher. So flaring back to deplete our speed. There's transverse flow. Should be roughly there. Dropping collective. And you see the sync rate's plummeting there. Okay, so now I'm in VRS. I pull in a little bit of power. My RPM. You see as I'm pulling in power, it's not doing anything. I'm just I'm still falling. My sync rate's not being arrested any. So let's say left. So I roll left. Not touching the collective. Roll left. My sync rate's coming back under control here. I'm back into the clock. So that's VRS. 
That's at a high altitude. It happens at low altitudes. It happens at any altitude. The thing you have to remember is that as soon as your speed dips below that translational lift boundary, if you're already in the VRS descent rate danger zone, that speed thing was the last thing that was keeping you from doing it. So now that we've got that basic understanding of, of vortex ring state, which is also known as the leading cause of amateur sim pilot's deaths, let's look at a typical landing from start to finish. When it comes to landing, you can do steep or shallow approaches, and a lot of it depends on the enemy threat in the area, as well as the terrain itself. Steep and shallow approaches play by the same rules, but generally speaking, shallow approaches, at least to me, feel safer to execute. Your mileage may vary, but that's what I get out of it. Here we'll, we'll do a reasonably shallow approach from about 150 feet, and we'll land at that building up ahead. What are the things that we need to worry about here? If we're doing a reasonable approach, our rotor RPM shouldn't be a huge factor. That plays more into it when you get aggressive with your landings or takeoffs. You should glance at it from time to time, particularly when we're starting a landing approach, to make sure that it's in the green, uh, and preferably well into the green and likely to stay there. But if you're doing this kind of a nice and smooth approach, you probably don't have to look at it that often. The main instruments you're watching are the airspeed indicator and the vertical velocity indicator. For your vertical velocity, you can sink however fast you want, as long as you don't overspeed your rotors, and as long as you don't dip below this, your safety speed. So like I said, I use 40 knots for this. As you're coming in, you reduce collective and pitch your nose up to flare and bleed your forward speed. As your airspeed approaches your safety margin, you ensure that your descent rate is no greater than 500 feet per minute, which you'll be decreasing the slower you get. Adjust your collective and make the corresponding pedal inputs as you slow down. Remember that every time you lower the collective, you'll need to decrease your left pedal usage, while raising the collective will require an increase in left pedal. You'll see your nose drifting left and right as you make these final collective changes during your descent, and the more you experience you become, the more you'll be able to anticipate them and minimize them, as well as know which ones aren't worth worrying about. Remember that after you've broken your safety speed margin, you'll either be in the process of losing your translational lift or close enough. It happens at about 20 knots. Think ahead and make sure you're pulling collective before your sink rate is increasing. This is a key thing to avoid VRS. You'll lower your collective and pitch your nose up at the start, then raise collective as you're losing translational lift, level off, and gently reduce collective to establish a sink rate that'll set you down lightly on the ground. Remember that you'll come into ground effect at this point as well, which will give you a slight bit of buoyancy requires a corresponding slight drop in collective to descend through it. And, as noted, you'll be changing your pedal inputs correspondingly during this entire process. So that's a basic landing. There's another thing that's common to see in ARMA that, when done in a sim without proper understanding of the flight dynamics, can be either extremely intense as a close call, or rather fatal. And usually it, it seems to be the latter. At the very least, you're likely to lose the ability to fly after you do this. This issue is from doing a J-hook turn, or a heavily curved path while slowing down or descending. If you overshoot an LZ, or have a need to suddenly turn and make a hasty LZ, uh, well, we'll just demonstrate it. This is going to be the wrong way to do things, but we'll try to hook ourselves around and land in this parking lot here. There it is. Boom. So if you were paying attention to my vertical speed and the horizontal speed as I did this, you would have seen what happens. We'll watch it again. You notice that as I made this sharp turn, I lowered collective because that's seemingly sensible, right? I'm trying to slow myself down and, and lose altitude, so I, I drop collective accordingly. The problem is that as you're making that turn, your sync rate's probably higher than you appreciate, and as you pass through that critical speed region where translational lift disappears, your sink rate will plummet and you'll VRS straight into the ground. If you notice it quickly enough, you might pull an extra collective and power your way out of it, but you also might not. So, how do you do this kind of turn? Well, as it turns out, it's actually... As it turns out... Oh, I hate myself for saying that. <sighs> it's actually really simple. When you get low like that and you're going to do a hard turn that'll slow you down, keep pulling in collective during the turn and watch your vertical speed. You don't have to keep it at zero or higher, you just don't want to get it so low that at the moment of translational lift loss, you go straight into VRS. So here, I'll, I'll set up and I'll do that kind of turn, the same one as before, over at that house, the cottage, whatever. And pay attention to my collective input, 
or the vertical velocity and see how I keep raising my collective to offset my slowing speed. Now this time I've gone all the way through it. I've gone, I mean, I'm doing a, a tight orbit overhead, yet I'm not falling out of the sky. And this is simply because I'm maintaining uh, a vertical speed that is within the safe region to avoid VRS. So practice that. You'll notice that once again, the key to a low speed maneuver, landing or, or anything like that, was in watching your vertical speed, controlling it, and being aware of when translational lift would disappear. The last one we'll talk about is a demonstration of, well, you'll, you'll see. For this, I'm going to fly in straight towards an LZ at high speed and low altitude, then do a very hard flare where I pitch my nose up and drop my collective, which is essentially going to use my the hull of my Huey as a giant air brake. Now, as I slow down, I'll level off again and pull in collective, and watch what happens. All right, so here we go. I'm going to pitch up, I'm going to drop bottom out the collective, and try to maintain a level attitude. Close enough. Now I'm getting a rotor overspeed because of this. I bring the collective back up. And you see me get this rotor RPM warning. And I settle to the ground even though I'm pulling collective. And as you can tell from the rotor alarm, first we had the, the high RPM one because so much air was going through the blades so fast it was speeding them up uh, to a, a pretty much dangerous level. And then as I pull in collective and level off, uh, we had a low RPM sound because both the engine and the rotor RPM dipped into a dangerous level. Uh, despite me pulling as much collective as I could, I still settled on the ground. I didn't have enough rotor speed and engine power to arrest my descent. If not for the relatively slow speed I was going at that point and the cushioning effect of ground effect, things could have been very bad. So this is something you, you can't really do at high speed. There's just not enough engine power available to arrest your speed without also slowing the rotors dangerously in the process. If you need to do a hard flare to kill speed, your starting speed needs to go be reasonably low. 60 knots or lower, uh, the lower the safer. The longer you take to do this flare, the safer. You know, the, Basically, the more aggressive you are with your helo, or the heavier your helo is, the faster your RPM is going to decay once you pull the collective back in. Whenever possible, it's best to do nice, smooth landings that don't rely on overly dramatic flares or similar in order to succeed. Now, with that being said, Understanding what happens when you do a real hard flare like that is very important because it allows you to do one if the situation requires it and it ensures that you're familiar with the dangers and limitations of such a maneuver. So we'll go over here back to that uh, LZ I used earlier and we'll do a more aggressive approach to it, a little bit faster, a little bit hotter and uh, more of a flare to it. Just kind of demonstrate the potential use of, of slowing down and how you can do it safely. So I'm well over translational lift so I'll, I'll Drop myself down here. And I'll pull him back. I haven't touched collective yet. Now I'm slowing down. Going through my safety speed here. A little bit of collective in. Just be safe. Below translational lift. And now I can just settle down. So a little bit more collective. I'm bouncing on ground effect now. My rudder centered out. Tail rudder rather. Descend down. And there you go. A nice smooth touchdown. One other thing worth touching on is the influence of wind. Whenever possible, you want to land into the wind. Uh, the easiest indication of this in DCS terms are these kind of smokestacks you see here. What's happening right now is a, is a fairly light wind. It's not too bad. But if you had a heavier wind, if there was, if there was blowing more horizontally, Landing against the wind would cause your vortex ring state to occur at a very different apparent ground speed. So you fly into the wind, VRS is less likely to occur. You fly with it, VRS is more likely to occur. When you're at the airfield about to take off, the best thing to do is to look around, find an indication of wind, and ensure you keep that in mind. And update your perception of wind based on smokestacks and similar as you're flying around. Those are some of the more important things to remember about landing the Huey. Uh, like all things helicopter, this is a hugely complex topic. I can't cover it all here, but I hope this has given you some useful insights into what to pay attention to during your landing attempts and flight in general. 
Uh, watch your vertical speed. Know when translational lift occurs and what it's like to gain or lose it. Pay attention to your rotor RPMs during demanding maneuvers or heavy loads or high altitudes. And be smooth and deliberate with everything you do. Most importantly, practice, practice, and practice some more. Thank you for your time, and I wish you the best of luck with your future Huey endeavors. So this is Dyslexi. Hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, take care.